Hello, I'm Jillian and thank you for joining me. This video outlines nine steps for creating a literature review paper in an academic context. I've used this process with upper level high school students, undergraduate and graduate students, and they've all found it helpful. So let me know in the comments how you find it and if you have any further suggestions or tips. Firstly, let me clarify what I mean by a literature review paper in an academic context. This is a synthesized summary of the conceptual, theoretical, and empirical scholarship on a particular topic. In other words, the concepts, ideas, and theories that scholars are discussing and the research that they're conducting on that topic. This paper is often used to set up one's own research study, for example, in a thesis or dissertation, but it can also be a standalone paper, as is often the case in coursework. The word synthesis is important because it reflects where many students go wrong. Synthesis indicates that you find themes that cut across the body of literature on the topic and you organize your summary around those themes. What some students do that is not correct is present, present descriptions of individual articles one at a time. Reporting article by article is like a strung together annotated bibliography and it lacks the element of discussion that literature reviews should have. So these nine steps will help to prevent your review from becoming an annotated bibliography. Here's a preview of the nine steps. Become familiar with a subject area, specify a topic, search for resources, review the resources, determine a conceptual framework, take notes, organize the notes, write and edit, and finally format the citations. So let's review them one at a time. The first step is become familiar with a subject area. This is the exploratory stage. We begin by reading and you want to read broadly so you get a feel for the subject area and its various topics. And don't forget about your course materials and notes if this is a course paper. It's also okay to use Google and Wikipedia at this point. I do so myself, although I would never rely on the information from those sources or cite them directly. I'll say a bit more on why shortly but they can be helpful in getting a feel for things. The second step is specify a topic of interest within the broader subject area that you've been reading about. Most subjects entail several topics and they can be quite intertwined. So in order to focus in and define your topic, you determine boundaries regarding what your topic will include and what it will exclude. Here's an example from my world. The subject area is ethical and moral schooling. It's very large, but there are several topics in this area. Five that I've investigated include social justice in the classroom, ethical and moral teaching practices, ethical and moral school leadership, classroom-based moral education, and ethical and moral school culture. How broadly and narrowly you define your topic depends in part on the breadth of the paper you intend to write. If your paper is large, you don't want to be too narrow in defining your topic or so specific that you won't have enough content to fill the paper. And if your paper is small, you don't want to be too broad trying to cover too much content because your paper can feel like one long introduction without much substance. There are exceptions, of course. Also, defining your topic will depend on the relevant body of literature. Some topics might not have a substantial body of literature from which to draw, and others might have too much for you to manage. So what you determine at this early stage in terms of a topic may be tweaked or modified later on as you delve more deeply into the specific body of literature. But making some decisions now based on your reading of the subject area will be helpful in guiding your literature search. The third step is search for relevant resources. The goal is not to find everything that's been written on a topic. For most topics, that's simply impossible to do, but rather to find enough resources to adequately represent the scope of scholarship. In a literature review, your resources are primarily books and journal articles. 
you want to ensure that the books are scholarly, meaning they're written by scholars and for scholars, and that the journal articles are peer reviewed, meaning other scholars in the same subject area or similar subject areas have reviewed the work and confirmed that it's valuable, worthwhile, and trustworthy. The peer review process takes place at the journal level. So journals themselves are either peer reviewed journals or they're not. And if they're peer reviewed journals, then all of the articles that they publish have been peer reviewed. So if you wanna know if your article is peer reviewed, find out if the journal undergoes a peer review process. Wikipedia and Google don't qualify as either scholarly or peer reviewed. But the reference list at the end of a Wikipedia article might have scholarly and or peer reviewed sources that would be suitable. So have a look through that list. And Google has a category called Google Scholar that also might have suitable resources. But I would double check that the resources Google labels as scholarly truly are that they or that, that they've gone through a peer review process because it's up to the author of the literature review to ensure the resources are suitable, not Google or Wikipedia. You don't need to fully read each resource at this point. Don't invest the time yet. What you want to do is flag resources for later review. Base your decision on the full title, the abstract or summary, publication date, temporal and geographical context, so when and where, and maybe the particular author. Whatever is relevant to how you defined your topic in step two. So for example, if you determined your topic was going to be environmental education in China, then geographical context is important. Or if you're exploring how teachers use technology in the classroom, then you want very recent publications. Anything older than three years is likely out of date unless you're doing a historical perspective. The example I'm showing here is a journal article. And you can see that you really don't need to look farther than the first page to decide if the article should be kept or rejected. For books, you need to look at a few more places, including the table of contents, the author's biography, and the copyright page. Here's a handy tip. When you identify a resource that looks really great, go to its list of resources at the end and see if there are any others that seem like they would be great as well. Also, identify authors that appear more than once because they might be key scholars in that particular topic. Then you can do a targeted search for these particular articles and these authors. It's a bit of a shortcut. You want to overselect resources at this point. In other words, flag more than you'll need because you're going to drop some later on in the process. If you feel like you will drown in resources, your topic might be too broadly defined. Try narrowing it. So instead, for example, of exploring a classroom phenomenon from K, kindergarten all the way to grade 12, maybe just concentrate on high school. Or see if you can divide your topic into smaller topics and then focus in on one of those. If you are having trouble finding enough resources, it's possible that your topic is too narrowly defined. So think about expanding it. For example, if you thought you would investigate something in a North American context, see if it works to expand it to all Western countries. Or think about joining two topics together that seem very connected. Whatever you include or exclude as you broaden or narrow how you define your topic has to make sense to your topic. It cannot be a random qualifier. So if you decide, for example, to search for resources only related to females, you need to be able to rationalize how gender is significant to your topic and why you can make this distinction. This is where your background reading again becomes helpful. The literature will guide you in this. Don't underestimate how much time this step takes. Start early. I tell my undergraduate students to start their literature searches at least three weeks before the essay is due. And then don't try to rush it. Getting great resources makes everything else so much easier, so it's worth it to take the time now. Step four. Now it's time to review the resources you flagged as potentially useful.
You still don't need to read them in depth since you overselected, but carefully read the introduction and conclusion and scan the body noting the headings and subheadings. You want to become familiar with the resources and what each offers to an understanding of the topic. Here's another tip. Use a sticky, that's a small piece of paper with an adhesive edge, to record a few key points on each article. You might include the author's context, so the geographical location and professional situation, the article's perspectives, theories and philosophical paradigms it draws on, its main ideas and or results if it's a research report, and how the resource informs the literature on the topic. This can be expanded into an annotated bibliography if the re assignment requires one, but it's a handy tool regardless to help you contextualize, understand, and sort your articles. It does not in any way become your paper. I'm referring again to the common mistake often made in writing literature reviews that I previously noted. You may, might realize that some of the articles you flagged aren't as relevant as you originally thought, and that's okay. Don't waste any more time on them. Step five, determine a conceptual framework for your paper. This refers to the main concepts, ideas, and themes that you identify in the body of literature you've been reading and around which you will organize your paper as a synthesized summary. Some people call this a theoretical framework. And if your topic is grounded in a lot of theory, then this would be appropriate. But not all topics are well theorized, and those that aren't tend to be organized around concepts, hence a conceptual framework. Your background reading on the broader subject area is once again helpful in determining this. If a lot of theory was referred to, then your topic might be well theorized, and you can call this a theoretical framework if you like. Not everyone's picky on this point, and it really doesn't change how we proceed from here. An important note. A literature review doesn't have original content, the point being to report on what others have said and done and what is already published. So there's nothing unique or original in that, except this framework, because this framework reflects how you are understanding that body of work. So this is your opportunity to demonstrate some reflective and analytical skills. It helps to map out your conceptual framework in a flowchart or other visual format. Include also the resources that will inform each part. This is where the sticky can help. I like building papers around three core concepts, but not all topics will fit into three, so let the literature guide you on this. Here's a specific example for a topic on moral education. Another tip, once you have this structure mapped out, Explain it to a peer and get their feedback on balance between the sections, clarity and coherence. It doesn't matter if they're familiar with the topic. In fact, it might be better if they're not because then they can listen openly without any preconceived ideas of how the topic might be organized. As you proceed through the next few steps, this framework might need some modifications. But if you've done a good job to this point with the background reading and article selection, then you will be able to do that quite readily. Step six, take notes on the resources you selected. Now you will carefully read the resources that made the final cut and take detailed point form notes according to your conceptual framework. I'll show you what I mean by this in a minute. Once again, you might drop more of the articles. You might also need to search for more if you don't end up with enough content in one or more of the sections. That's okay, it's part of the process. These steps are not necessarily linear. There is some circling around as things develop, but it's circling as a spiral so that you're still moving forward and the paper is coming together. Here's how I would set up for note-taking based on my three concepts. Also, be on the lookout for content that might be useful in the introduction and for an interesting way to conclude the paper that's both summative and maybe a little provocative. I usually leave the introduction and conclusion till the end because it helps to know what you're introducing and concluding, so I like to have the body of the paper well formed, but I jot down ideas now as I'm reading so they don't get lost. Here's an important tip. 
record the citation with page number for every point you write. In other words, identify specifically where you got every piece of information. You'll be moving the points around and it's so painful to have to find that citation later. In fact, sometimes it's impossible and if you can't find the citation, you can't use the point. In the previous step, you were jotting down notes as they came out of the articles while you were reading them. Now you want to organize those notes so the ideas are cohesively grouped and they flow coherently within the sections. And you want to do this while they're still in point form. It's a lot easier to move around points than it is to move around fully formed sentences. But again, don't lose the citations. Make sure they travel with the points. To organize the notes, think of each main section of the body of your paper as a mini essay with its own introduction, conclusion, and themes or ideas. Here's another tip. Use a lot of headings and subheadings at this point to organize your ideas and stay on track. This is also the time to begin developing the introduction and conclusion since you now know what you're introducing and concluding. These two sections are mirror images in their structure and overall function, so I find it helpful to develop them together. They serve to transition the reader between the broad subject context that you were first reading about and the more specific topic of your paper. But they also have more particular responsibilities. The introduction is guided by the question, what is this paper about? And the conclusion is guided by the question, why should anyone care? There's a lot more to say on introductions and conclusions and I'll try to make another video for you because they're really important and quite tricky to conceive. In fact, I find the conclusion the hardest part, the most challenging part of any paper I write. Step 8. Write and edit. Once your point form notes are well organized, the paper almost writes itself. So this is an opportunity to be writerly. And you can do that in two ways. The first is vary the sentence structure so that you create different rhythms. And the second is to use interesting vocabulary so you add flavor. This will increase the reader's enjoyment of your paper. The subheadings that you used in your notes may now be dropped and replaced with clear guiding sentences, especially if your paper is small, maybe 2,000 to 2,500 words. But if your paper is longer, maybe 5,000 words, you probably need to keep some subheadings so that your reader stays oriented. The headings for the main sections, however, usually remain. It isn't necessary to put a heading for the introduction. It's obvious that the first section is an introduction and it should be written in that way to ease the reader into your paper. But it does help to indicate with a heading where the conclusion begins so that readers don't confuse it with your final concept. Another tip, once you have a good draft, get a peer to read it, not just to identify mechanical and technical problems like punctuation, spelling, and grammar, but to challenge you to explain, define, and clarify anything that they're uncertain of or not convinced of. So now we're at the final stage, format the citations. As I previously mentioned, citations are how you identify which resource an idea is from. Remember that the content of a literature review paper is not your own, so you need to give credit and you need to enable readers to find the original if they desire. You do this with in-text citations throughout the body of the paper, with footnotes or endnotes, and with a list of resources at the end of your paper. And there are different formats for doing this such as APA, MLA, Chicago, and AMA. If a particular format isn't specified by the assignment, then use the format that's typical for your subject area. So for example, APA is typical in the social sciences, MLA in Chicago in humanities, and AMA in medicine. One final tip, beware of citation generators like BibMe, Bib This For Me, and Citation Machine. They make a lot of mistakes, but they're not responsible for the accuracy of citations in your paper. That's your responsibility. Finally, don't underestimate how much work this is and how much time it can take. 
So that's the nine steps. Here they are again. Although I presented them as linear, I'll remind you that there is a cyclical element as you become more familiar with the body of literature you're immersing in. But backtracking is often just tweaking and modifying. There should still be a feeling of moving forward, even if you have to go back in stage six and find a few more sources. As a final comment, these steps were developed for a literature review type paper, but they might also be relevant to other types of papers, and I'll leave that to you to decide. Remember to let me know in the comments if you found this helpful, and please add your own suggestions and tips. If you would like more videos of this nature, subscribe to the channel so I know, and I'll do my best to prepare them for you.